I think the reason I wanted to make this film was because I've lived with Parkinson's disease now for about 10 or 11 years and I'm still able to lead an active life. Some of this is down to luck, but I believe some of it is due to lifestyle, which in my case involves a good amount of exercise, and that, I think, helps keep the Parkinson's symptoms at bay. Although I understand that patients with severe Parkinson's symptoms can do little in the way of exercise, I've also met people recently diagnosed with Parkinson's who are very distressed and despondent. And I really want to say to them through this film, this is not the end of your life. You can carry on doing most of the things you did before, but you will have to be prepared to make changes. I also thought a film just about Parkinson's could be a bit dry. So I decided to try to mix it up with a passion of mine, the blues. I'm not sure if it's going to work, but I'm happy I've given it my best shot as my debut in the film industry, so here we go. I'm standing beside an area of coastline, which is known as the Essex Marshes. This is a vast area of land on the east coast of Great Britain which comprises mainly rivers, lakes, ponds. The coastline is littered with sandbanks. I think it's important to me because it's an area where I have spent quite a lot of time in the past, mainly sailing, and I feel a, a kind of closeness, attachment to the area. An old man I met once told me that the only way you could really experience the Essex marshes was to take off your socks and shoes and get your feet in the mud and walk around in it and really, really feel what it was all about. So I think we'll give that a go. <laughs> I think the first time I noticed something was wrong was probably about 10, 11 years ago when I was on a course with other lawyers and we broke off for lunch from the course and I was sitting next to a lawyer talking to him eating lunch and I suddenly noticed that my left arm holding my fork was shaking and then I, probably a few weeks later I think I was on the underground either going to or coming home from the office and reading the newspaper and I noticed that my arm was shaking again. So I thought I'd better have it checked out and went to see my GP. And she carried out one or two tests and thought I ought to go to see a consultant. So I did that and um, apparently there are all manner of tremors of different parts of the body, legs and arms and so on. But anyway, after some debate, the conclusion was that I did have Parkinson's and um, it's, it's a pretty shocking thing. I mean, there is a day when they actually tell you that's their diagnosis and it, it rather hits you. <laughs> it does feel quite good, actually. I'm not sure it really helps my appreciation of the marshes, but um, at least I gave it a go. This is Sudbury in Suffolk, which is just across the border from Essex, and it's, it's an area that I've spent a lot of time in in the past. Um, we're actually at a hotel, which was an old mill, called the Mill Hotel, surprisingly. I used to bring my mother, well, I used to bring my parents here, and then latterly my mother, and we'd have lunch in the mill, and when she could, we'd take a walk through the meadows. Uh, in the summer, they have cattle grazing here and it's, it's just a lovely spot. My band used to play in various pubs in the town, in, in, in hotels and the town hall and that kind of thing. So um, I spent a lot of time here in the past and uh, just it's a very old town and just a very pretty, pretty part of the country really. I think 
once you know the, 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 the worst, you, you really can go one of two ways. I mean, you can either drift into a kind of depression and, and, and a feeling that you know, your, your active life is over, or you can develop a sort of combative attitude towards it and say, well, you know, it won't be easy, but it's not going to be the end of my life. And uh, I, I don't know whether I did it consciously or subconsciously, but I think I went for the latter. So I went to see the consultant and we started off on some medication. And uh, it never really seemed to do very much. And so despite my attitude, I was beginning to be pulled down by it. And um, really things changed when I went to see the GP again. And he said, well, I'm not sure these, these, this medication is really working for you. I think you ought to perhaps go and see a consultant who, who does what they call DBS, which is the deep brain stimulation or brain surgery by any other name. So I went to see him and that was quite a revelation really because we didn't actually talk about brain surgery or DBS at all. He, he looked at me and examined me and immediately said, I think we could try some different medication. And at first I was a bit skeptical because we'd already tried one or two uh, different drugs. But anyway, I gave it a go and um, the, the change was quite remarkable. Over probably a, a month or so, I began to feel quite different and the, the, the tremor was much less and the, um, the just the general feeling that, that this, this, this ailment had taken over your body. I could do things again and I started playing tennis and started running and playing a bit of music. So I think the message I would want to get across to other sufferers is, you know, you can't really let that stand in your way. I mean, it's your life. You only live once and, and so you've got to make the best you can of it. I first heard the blues when I was about 11 or 12, obviously living at home. Um, we used to have a radio or what we called a wireless in those days and I would get onto the uh, dial and go through the wave bands and it was quite exciting because you could feel you were going around the world almost different languages would come through and different noises and one night I was just uh, doing this and I suddenly heard this man singing and playing guitar and it it was the most mournful sort of sad sound I think I'd ever heard and um, I was quite captivated by this sound and I worked out that this was a show or a program on the radio every week and so after that initial uh, stroke of luck I tuned in religiously nearly every week and I um, started listening to the blues or what I came to know as the blues on a regular basis. Um, I remember my mother at the time would come into the room and say I don't know why you're wasting your time listening to those old men groaning on the radio. And I don't think I tried to explain to her what it was, but um, I carried on listening anyway. And uh, that's how I started listening to the blues. And then I got to know various names like Robert Johnson and Elmore James and, uh, and uh, Big Bill Brunsey and people like that. And um, after a while, the blues started coming over to the UK. Uh, it took quite a while to, to arrive because m many of the US musicians uh, were not given permission to play in the UK because of union pressure from, from the, 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 the British unions. But eventually that seemed to subside and the, the bands started coming over. And that's when we started hearing people like Muddy Waters and, and uh, Lightning Hopkins and, and all these, these up-and-coming blues artists. 
bands such as the Rolling Stones and Alexis Corner and uh, people like Eric Clapton made a huge contribution to bringing the blues to the UK. And um, so eventually the, the, the music arrived in the UK in, in quite a big way. And then of course it was followed by the explosion of rock music or rock and roll. And, um, but really when you listen to a lot of rock and roll, you can hear the blues in the, in the music quite easily. The, 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 a lot of the sequences are the same. And uh, it, it's, it's quite apparent that that's really where rock and roll originated. You know, the reality is for many people, life is, is very hard. Um, they may be poor, they may be sick, they may have all manner of problems. And really, they're living the blues every day. And uh, I think to me, the essence of the blues is that not only are you, are you suffering in some way, but it's, it's, it's more the fact that there's really nothing you can do about your situation. You're kind of trapped in this, in this world or with this problem that you have and it isn't going to go away and it's this kind of inevitability which to me is, is really the, in the heart of the blues. If you take something like Parkinson's, you've got this thing inside you and basically it isn't going to go away um, unless one of the brilliant and dedicated researchers comes up with a cure or, or something approaching a cure, you know, you, you are going to be with it for as long as you live. And um, so there is it also the inevitability of your sort of medical situation. Um, and I think when you when you wake up in the mornings you you have to make a decision really I mean either you're going to reach for your walking shoes or or you know whatever it is you do to, to be active or you say well I just I just don't think I can fight it anymore I mean I've been I've been fighting it as long as I can but I've I'm really I've really had it and I think that's when I would say you 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 would you would feel the blues. Um, so so can Parkinson's give you the blues? I would say definitely. So today we're in the London borough of Sutton, in the county of Surrey, and I'm very excited. We're going to see Barbara Thompson and her husband, John Heisman, who are two of the leading jazz musicians, or I should say jazz slash rock musicians in the country. We happen to have chosen the hottest day in the country for 165 years, but I don't think that will make any difference to us. And uh, this is a very exciting day for me and probably David, my cameraman, Barbara Thompson has a career spanning the 60, late 60s, 70s and through until recent times. She has produced a huge number of albums with her band called Paraphernalia and also with one or two other bands which she's been associated with over the years. Parkinson's disease about 17, I think about 17 years ago, and uh, she has had a pretty difficult time with it. She 
actually retired at one point because she could no longer play and she wasn't able to go on tour. And uh, about two or three years ago, she started trying a new drug. No, well, it's not just a new drug, but a new form of delivery of the drug, which is just as important. And she's had very good results from that, such that she started playing again. So um, to be able to go and interview these people is a very exciting and a great privilege for me. If I could begin with you, Barbara, you began your very successful musical career back in the 1970s and you were first diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 1997. You continued playing with the help of tablet medication until you found it too difficult to play. That must have been a very difficult time for you, both physically and emotionally. Could you tell us something about that period? I went to see my GP who said, oh, it's only a trapped nerve. And he sent me to some specialists and it took a year to find out. I, I composed a lot when, when um, I was diagnosed because I didn't know how much time I had left to be active. So it, it, it did affect me, but um, in a way I got more writing done because I had Parkinson than, than if I hadn't. I wrote uh, tuba concerto, flute concerto, um, several concertos for saxophone quartet and strings. And my career didn't stop. I've got a new album coming out called The Last Fandango. And, the Last uh, fan Fandango? The Last Fandango, okay. yes. It will be The Last Fandango. <laughs> and this is an album which um, has turned out really well. Yeah, it's really good. When I get engrossed, um, I forget about um, Parkinson totally. And when I'm working <coughs> with musicians, I forget. So um, I can still get away from it, which yeah. is the main thing. I think the, the worse I feel, the happier my music is. It's, it's a <laughs> it seems to work the opposite way. And of course, one mustn't forget that Parkinson is not just a movement disorder problem. It, it, we know that the drug which is produced in the brain, which is what we think Parkinson's sufferers lack, which is dopamine, actually is a, is a mind-altering drug. Mm -hmm. And it actually changes mood, it changes everything. So when Barbara's down, she's a completely different person from when Barbara's up. Yes. So it's a really quite complicated game, this. It's not just about movement disorder at all. Um, Barbara Thompson, John Heisman, thank you very much. A pleasure. Um, London borough of Orpington and we're going to see a man called Bill Worrell. Bill is a bass player and used to play with Barbara Thompson and her band. A few years ago I just happened to be going through YouTube and I came across Barbara Thompson and I played the YouTube uh, of her and it was actually a program she recorded for the BBC. They also interviewed Bill it, during the program. And to my surprise and, and shock, it transpired that Bill also had Parkinson's disease. We made an arrangement to meet. And um, so we're going to see Bill, I must say with a degree of trepidation because I have a feeling his symptoms are quite a bit worse than, certainly worse than mine, probably worse than Barbara's. Bill did warn me that he's susceptible to fairly violent movements of his limbs when, he's, when his drugs are wearing off. So anyway, we shall see what, um, what state he's in shortly when we get to his house.
Bill, it's very nice to see you again after all these years. Not, not just because we're both Parkinson sufferers, but it's nice to catch up with you. The interesting thing is, you, you, despite your symptoms, you can still play piano very well, as far as I could tell. Well, it's, um, and, uh, it does help with a little bit of practice, which I haven't done for a long while. <laughs> well, but we, it, it, we could all do with more practice, I guess. There is a, a certain element of um, just confidence, uh, which is, 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 is yeah. sapped heavily by Parkinson's. I mean, apart from playing, but just, just generally, um, yes. uh, life yeah. and the uh, for doing anything is... Um, I, I know the feeling, yeah. It's but diminished. it's interesting how people seem to have maybe one or two things they can still do very well. You're, you're on a fairly new system of medication, I think. Can you just tell us briefly about that? Yeah, it's an app ago. Um, I'll just take a thing. That's it. And, um, so it's like a, a drip into your, yeah, so it, into your abdomen? Well, it, it's, it, it's at the moment when it's going to my leg. You set the how quickly you want it to to come yeah. out and, and and then you put a new one of these on every day um, it's, um so uh, as they say can you pump up the volume if you feel you need more or it, it, well, is it sort of set to be um, a stand? no you, you can um there is a, a bolus dose button amongst other things on there and that's designed specifically for um uh giving you an added um, amount yes um, do, do you not have any help at all in you know generally in the house? I mean, not not necessarily a nurse, but um, you know, to do work or cleaning. No, no I, I keep meaning to. Um, no, it's, it's none of my business, but I'm just no, curious. No, no, it's, it's something that I ought to um, do, and I, I'm aware of it. And certainly, in terms of, um, well, I mentioned about the, my backache, I have mm -hmm. a lumbar renal waste, which gets really. Well, I'm, I'm so used to being, being bad that um, even when it's like probably most people's bad is my almost non-existent. I mean, do, do you do, do you find that? I mean, do people still contact you and, and ask about your music and what um, you're doing? Or? No, um, almost um, nothing at all. It's, it's a weird, weird existence in a way. I, it's when you don't, you're not doing the gigs. Um, you just don't see the people anymore. Mm. come back from Bill Worrell's house, having spent about two hours with Bill, and um, there's no point in pretending I'm quite upset by the whole thing. Um, Bill is clearly in quite a bad way with his Parkinson's. I just have very mixed emotions. I mean, I feel, I feel very sorry for him. I mean, he doesn't seem to have any particular support. I mean, he, he doesn't have a Parkinson's nurse, which he's entitled to under the NHS. Um, he doesn't seem to be seeing his consultant very often, but on the other hand, it may be down to him. It, I don't, I'm not apportioning blame anywhere. Um, in a way, he's quite happy. He's got a lovely house, and he's he's does his own thing. And um, when he was playing the piano, I, I was, to be honest, I was close to tears because I just felt there was such kind of feeling in what he was playing, but also a, a kind of t touch of desperation. I mean, I, I said I'd like to keep in touch with him and not leave it another 30 years and, uh, and he said he would send me some music which I think he probably will so I'll keep in touch with him and, and in a tiny tiny way be a bit of support to him but um, I think he really needs more than people like me.
what it says to me is, you better do everything you can to ameliorate the, the disadvantages of it because it's, it's kind of ready to take you over. It's, it almost reminds me of that old movie called The Invasion of the Body Snatchers, this uh, thing from outer space which gets into your body and it just changes, you don't look any different, but it just changes you completely inside. You've got it in you. And, and, and there's no doubt about it, but you don't really know what it's going to do. You know, is it, is it a friendly alien or a hostile alien? Or, and I don't know, maybe there's a side of you which just says, you know, screw it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, I've, I've got it and I, it's not going to spoil my life you know, or, or, or my family's life. Okay, it's Friday morning and another beautiful day in London and this morning we're going to see Dr. Bain who is my consultant neurologist at the Charing Cross Hospital which is one of the leading teaching hospitals in London. And we're getting to the heart of the documentary. I want to ask him some questions about medication and to what extent patients should be able to try different uh, drugs if they find the drugs they've been prescribed are not really working, what the options are for operations and so on, and also what he knows about the latest research. So um, it should be an interesting meeting. I was originally referred to you by my GP because he didn't feel that Parkinson's medication I was on was very effective and he thought I might like to discuss the deep brain stimulation with you, or, or, or brain surgery, I suppose we would call it. Yeah. Um, when I first came to, when I first met you, to ostensibly to talk about that, we actually didn't really talk about it at all, but we seemed to go on to, the, on to medication, and you seemed to think that um, you could possibly change my medication and, to, to my advantage. And, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, when when we changed, yeah. it was it was it was an enormous change for me, a, a huge improvement. Yeah. Um, I'm just I'm just uh, curious, I suppose, as to why you thought that might, or I I might be I might benefit from that sort of change. Yeah. So w when I looked at the treatment that you were on, um, th there was a, a, an issue that I see quite often, which is that patients tend to be, um, somewhat surprisingly, a little under-treated. And so I saw that there was a lot of scope for um, improving your treatment, not necessarily by increasing the dose, but making the drugs um, have a more prolonged action, so using forms of the drugs that had a longer action. And um, we did that by um, converting from Cinemet to Stelevo, which prolongs the action of the cinemet by about an hour and a half, mm -hmm. and also using prolonged action pramipexol rather than standard pramipexol. And that gave a much smoother cover during um, the day and, and night. And the other thing we did is that we used a, a drug called propranolol for tremor. Now, there were some very old studies of propranolol for tremor in Parkinson's, and um, I think a lot of the um, modern doctors have forgotten those studies because propranol is used for tremor outside Parkinson's a lot. Mm -hmm. But the original studies were that they are actually quite effective. If a patient was taking certain drugs and felt they weren't really doing the job, I mean, do you, it seems to me that the patient should come back to or go to see his doctor or her doctor and say, you know, they're not, they don't seem to be effective, you know, can I try something else? Because, in a way, what have they got to lose, you know? Yeah. But, I mean, would, 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 you, would you share that view? Or would, yeah, I mean, I, probably more scientific than I put it, but, you know. When um, one's got trouble with one's drugs, I think it's very important to see somebody who is expert and use those drugs multiple times on patients. And the reason is, is often the patient's on the right drug, but either the wrong dose or the wrong time or the wrong 
um, formulation of that drug or slightly wrong combinations, um, that uh, minor tinkering with that can make a quite significant change in quality of life. Um, as I'm sure you know, there's research going on into Parkinson's in different parts of the world, in the United States, in Switzerland, and probably others. Is there any particular project going on at the moment which you, you, you feel is, is, is interesting, which has, has good potential? Yeah, they're the, the sort of symptomatic treatments um, that people are pioneering. And uh, one of those is inhaled form of levodopa that's um, being tested at the moment in various um, centres. And the advantage of that is that some people with Parkinson's have very, very rapid wearing off. And if they then take another tablet, it can take half an hour or 45 minutes to work. But with the inhaled levodopa, it looks like it only takes five to 10 minutes to work. And therefore, the person can be rescued from that off period very quickly. And I think that's a very encouraging development. And we're in phase three start, uh, trials of that now, um, which is uh, sort of near to the point of coming to market. And so that's one thing. And I think the other thing is the deep brain stimulation side of the treatment of Parkinson's, um, which has been going on quite a long time now, mm -hmm. um, for nearly two decades. And we're getting better at that with um, more elaborate devices that are more programmable. So we can be more accurate with the targeting of those centers. And I think that's another um, positive step forward on the symptomatic treatment. Just one more question, if I may. Um, I have a good friend who has a good friend who's just been diagnosed with Parkinson's. I, I don't know which hospital. I don't think it's anything to do with this one. And um, she'd like to see me and talk to me. Um, if, if you were in my position, what would you say, what message would you give to her yeah. starting out on this long journey? Yeah, I, I would say that the first thing is make a decision to keep active and to uh, be busy. And from that point of view, I think the phrase would be be a moving target and not a sitting duck. And movement seems to help Parkinson's in a big way. Um, most patients will say that if they move around or, or are walking or things like that, that the, the off periods are much less profound. Mm -hmm. And it also drives the stiffness and rigidity away. Also, meta-analyses of trials of exercise for Parkinson's have shown that they help the Parkinson's and they help the quality of life of the person. Dr. Bain, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yes. Beverly has been wonderful about my condition. Um, she is very sympathetic, but doesn't, doesn't do things to make me feel abnormal. Um, she carries on as if everything is as it should be. And that is actually, for me, the best way she could deal with it. It might not suit everyone, but it certainly suits me. And uh, I'm very lucky to be with her. So, thank you. Mm, my pleasure. That. I love you. And uh, here we are in the Blue Ridge Mountains. <laughs> in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Ready to, uh, ready to shake a leg, yep, as you call yep. it here. And see Keith and the band, who's heading the band. No, and, I'm not uh, heading the band. You're not? No, okay. I'm well. just one of the band. All right. And uh, <laughs> we can't wait for the band tonight. The gig came about because the Bird family, my wife's family, were having a reunion of members of the family from all over the United States. And um, I started playing music with Natalie, my daughter in law. Uh, we were just play at home and uh, she would sing as well and played violin and we did one or two, um, I wouldn't call them gigs, but they were just uh, sessions when the family were at the house and, um, and it sort of grew from there really and then my nephew's wife Gina also joined us. I, I didn't know at the time that she had actually been a professional singer and dancer and um, 
Natalie was also a very proficient violinist, a singer, and also plays piano and, uh, and has recently also taken up the guitar. And so the, the three of us um, started playing together and we thought it would be nice if we could play a gig somewhere. And the, um, the bird reunion came on, onto the menu. So I made some inquiries and they seemed quite happy to have us to play. at it is this, if you've got Parkinson's you've really got quite enough to deal with and you don't need anything else so you've got to try to keep the rest of your health in good order so you aim to have a good diet, you don't get dehydrated and you also try to avoid things like falling over and I know that may seem rather or sound rather facile but I try to make sure that, that Parkinson's is the only thing I'm really suffering from. Also, I think it's important to keep the mind and the brain active because uh, that's obviously very relevant to, to the whole issue. And I find things like playing games very helpful. I'm, I'm a bit of a Scrabble enthusiast and I try to keep up with the news. Also, the medication. You've got to get the medication right. Um, it may take some time and, and you may have to do a bit of arguing with the medical authorities, but if you, if you can get it right, it, 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 it can change life in, enormously. It did for me and, uh, and I'm eternally grateful to the, to the doctors who, 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 who basically got it right for me. It's probably best if you film this side of my face because the other side is bleeding profusely. Some tasks become difficult uh, things like buttons and, and writing perhaps becomes difficult but there are often ways around these problems I mean velcro is a very clever invention and you know I, I haven't done it myself but there probably will come a time when I shall swap all my buttons for velcro and and, and not worry about it you know I, I've got a problem and I'm modifying my clothes and, and you know tough I, I kind of think of it in a way as a bit like having a bad neighbour, you know, you've, you, you, you can't do anything about it, they're not going to go away, but you can sort of take a position with them which, which, you know, gives you the quality of life that you want, regardless of the fact that they're living right next door. I decided to dedicate this film to my parents for two reasons, really. One, they were very good parents to me. And secondly, because they became involved with Parkinson's disease themselves when my father got it in, this would be back in the 1960s. Although the doctors knew what Parkinson's was, or kind of knew what it was, 
they didn't really have anything to treat it with and so people really just had to grin and bear it and um, then the drug was discovered which it enables them to produce dopamine which is, is the, the, the missing ingredient in the brain. My father was given this drug by a, a leading hospital in, in England, in Cambridge. By that time the Parkinson's was fairly well advanced and this may seem a bit brutal now but we, we just couldn't get him to be active. I mean he did a little bit of gardening, he quite liked gardening but by and large he really he really just sat in his armchair, um, which we, we now know was probably one of the worst things he could have done. And eventually he had to go into a home where he could be properly looked after. And, and he was in the care home until he died. And mother was, was very loyal. She visited him every week, probably two, three, maybe four times a week. And um, to me, the overriding lesson is that activity and exercise are terribly important. I mean, Dr. Bain said when we went to see him that better to be a moving target than a sitting duck. And I think what he meant by that was that if you are on the move as much as you can be, then it, it, it's just generally more difficult for the symptoms to pull you down. Of course, I have to say again that this is not really going to apply to those who are seriously disabled through Parkinson's because there may not be very much they can do. But certainly in, in relation to more recently diagnosed cases, if, if they can get onto a regime where they're exercising regularly and, and just as important really to get the med medication sorted and, and get it not only the right medication but the right dosage and the right intervals and so on and so forth then I think at that point you can still have a very fulfilling life and, and you can carry on with you know many of your activities that you were involved with previously. We can only do as much as we're able but what I think I'm saying is do what you can but don't be afraid to try something new. plan to carry on with my activities. I particularly enjoy playing music and at the moment I seem to be able to play without too much difficulty so I shall continue with that. I'd like to do a bit more to help raise money for research. Um, obviously research into something like Parkinson's is terribly important and uh, I gather around the world there are something like 600 serious research projects underway for this disease and um, one of those is a very interesting project in Virginia called Focused Ultrasound and, and that, that is, is I think a very exciting project. Are there any challenges I would like to achieve personally? You mean like climbing Everest and that sort of thing? Not really, it doesn't, doesn't really appeal very much. Um, but I would like to play the guitar like B.B. King. Not much chance of that, I'm afraid.